So, what you're actually burning down here in the combustion zone is some combination of charcoal and tar gas. In the updraft, remember, um, air is coming in and hitting the charcoal. So we're only burning the charcoal. In a downdraft, we're burning some combination of the charcoal and tar gas. Um, the tar gas is being produced up here. We're taking it down through a constriction. This is usually the constriction that you'll see in an in-birth heart. We're bringing an air right above that. And the air mixed with, with the tar gas and the, the charcoal combusts, um, then moves through the charcoal bed and runs reduction. Um, the tar gas is preferentially burned over the charcoal because you can get much greater reaction um, sites going on between a gas to gas mix versus a gas to solid mix. Even with the very high surface area of charcoal, you still get a preferential oxidation of the tarry gas versus the charcoal. So the goal in a downdraft gasifier is to deal with this geometry and all of these nozzles, um, nozzle sizes such that you get a blast in here and fully fill this, this combustion hearth with a, a big lobe of fire that all of the tar gas is, is forced through. I'm going to burn all that tar gas, generate this incredibly high temperature environment, but you're sure you're going to break all that and it can't pass into the reduction zone. If you have a hole in the middle here, or this geometry is wrong and the nozzles are too big and you don't get the blast, now you can get um, pyrolysis gas passing through this bed and out through the bottom. Okay? Yes? Is the reason for that shape for everything so it burns completely within that small shape. Correct. You're trying to fully trap or fully isolate the pyrolysis gases above here and not let any of it go through this bed um, without passing through the very high temperatures. Okay? So that's your breaker. Okay? You want to burn, you want to be burning all of that tar gas on its way through here. So, so if you get that geometry wrong or you pull it too slow or you know, your air nozzles are wrong side, you won't fill this whole lobe. The goal isn't to spot high temperature right in front of one of the nozzles. The goal is to spread that whole combustion lobe around there and completely fill that environment to ensure full conversion. So you want to err on the, on the side of undersizing that area versus oversizing? Chemically and thermally, yes. Um, in terms of material handling, no. It, it, the smaller it gets, then it becomes difficult to get the stuff to pass through there. So you're often fighting uh, those competing problems. But in general, yes, that's why you end up with that very tight constriction. So you, you, you really don't want the pyrolysis gas, you want the reduction zone gas? You only want the reduction gas. You do not want the pyrolysis okay. gas. The pyrolysis gas is dirty. The pyrolysis gas is the craseid. Pyrolysis gas is the mess in your um, barbecue or the mess in your lungs when you smoke. Okay? You don't want that in the engine because it will stick the valves. Uh, engines are much more sensitive than your lungs, actually. They don't process the tar out. Is yep. part of that configuration to create the gas artillery going down? Not really, because this is filled with solid material. Okay, so actually, this material here is just some sort of um, chunky field or void space. So the gas is passing between the fuel, okay? uh, which is the, one of the foundation problems we'll get to here in a moment. Um, the combustion and cracking is happening in all that void space between the fuel. Um, as that void space changes around, um, your space for the, the combustion and cracking changes, um, and the amount of surface area you have for production reactions changes, and it introduces other problems with the figure. Okay? I realize we've optimized the sizing. Um, but the problem is as you change your fuel sizes around, the real, real space that the gas is flowing isn't the sheet metal here. Um, your reactor is as much defined by the spaces between the fuel as it is anything about your sheet metal here. Okay, so if you change the fuel size or the shape, the real areas that the gas is flowing fundamentally change. Okay, which is why in an Ember reactor, 
everyone is always so, uh, there's so much consideration of the fuel type that's putting, you're putting in it. The fuel is actually more determinative of the shape of all of this, these reaction zones here than the, the sheet metal um, that makes it. Correct. So that's why a closed top open or downdraft type gasifier is so sensitive to moisture content. Because all of the, the moisture that is generated here in the drying zone has to go down through combustion. Okay. So if you, your material is too wet, you can get so much moisture coming down here that it's going to um, you know, knock your temperatures down here. If your temperatures don't stay high enough, you don't break all the tars, and you're going to get tar coming out at the end. So this is why why, why Inbrook gas fires worked in World War II is not because it was some amazing design. They had a very basic design, but they totally controlled the fuel. The fuel was produced like gasoline and was delivered in bags. It's very specific shapes and size. It was species controlled, and it was most importantly moisture controlled. It had to be a 10% or under. They stamped it. They had like whole regulatory committees to, to deal with it. Um, so if you get a, a, a moist fuel up here, I mean, cut down, you take material from the side of the road, it's going to be 30-40% if it, um, very easily. And so no, all that moisture is going to pass down through here and it's going to snuff your combustion zone. So downdraft ember type gasifiers are very sensitive to moisture until you start doing modifications up here, which is what, what we do on the toddy thing and I'll get to in a second here. So, so the combustion the gas What? What? Well, the problem with sawdust in here is you've created this constriction. You have the, the gas is going through all the void space. It has to pass through the material. Um, and so you end up with a very small amount of real usable cross-section for the gas to flow. So you put sawdust in there, it's essentially a solid bed. So it becomes very difficult for the material to go through. As you, the, the fuel gets smaller, you get um, more reaction surface. So your reaction rates and speeds change significantly. And equally important is the material handling problem. If you put, um, sneeze. If you put um, particulate fuel down in here, both gravity and your gas are going in the same direction, so it tends to pack it. You get a, uh, you get bell packing, is what we usually call it, in the base here. Whereas an updraft, the material, or the gas is going in the opposite direction of gravity, so it tends to keep it a little looser. So downdraft is really sensitive to packing here in the base which is another reason why I use these chunky fuels. So you want them to, to, to keep getting smaller and smaller and then pass out of the machine before they pack up into the base. So definitely, if you were to use something like solid, you probably want Yeah, but then your tar um, relationships are incorrect, so you're gonna get, you're gonna get tar and, and water out the top. Chief, would it matter if you pelletize that or for repetitive and burn that yeah, so you can take a, a small fuel and you can take it through a densification process um, and then operate it as a chunk fuel here. The problem with that is because these are closed top and they're generating steam, you can decompose the, the um, densified fuel in the top because now you have an environment here that's filled with steam. Okay. While it's running, it tends to be okay, but if you shut it down and let it sit there overnight, you'll often get um, the fuel decomposing. Okay. So this is the same, um, the, the GEC is doing the same basic arrangement, though, though built differently. This is the core inside of the GEC um, where we've added an air preheating system. So as you see in this, you know, in this idea, um, ideagram here, the gas is just coming out straight after reduction. That has a tremendous amount of usable heat. You'd like to do interesting things with it. Um, you see, if we go all the way back to the updraft, the updraft is thermally very efficient. 
Though chemically it makes a mess, thermally it's highly optimized. All the heat you make in the bottom is progressively mined at lower and lower temperature um, um, processes. So that what comes out the top is going to be you know, somewhere in the realm of 100 C. You still have drying material coming in. It's very thermally efficient. You capture all of the, the, the heat generated from combustion to do usable work. Okay, but at the cost of a chemical mess. Um, the downdraft parses things differently. Um, you get a, a reasonable chemical product, but you're wasting all of the heat here in the gas that in the updraft is being used to run pyrolysis and drying. So you'll see as we go forward here, what we're doing a lot of the toddy stuff is recovering this waste heat here in the gas and returning it to various processes um, upstream in the gasification process. Okay. So the first place it's returned to is the incoming air. These red lines here are the incoming air. The outgoing gas is filling up this angular space between, between the reactor and the gas gallon, and then it goes out the gas tank. So that's those spiral lines that you see inside the projector done out of stainless steel. All of the, all of the rising gases that have to fill are going over the heat exchanger with the air coming in. Okay? So, the result is instead of taking gas right out of here at 700 or something C, you mine about half of the heat back into the gas, so the gas going out of the reactor, and it's somewhere between you know, 200 and 300 C. So we didn't have gas that's much easier to deal with in the downstream components. Uh, you need much less of a cooler, um, you can use lower temperature filtration processes. So not only does it help the thermal balance of the thing and your top temperature, it also simplifies your downstream um, process. But other than that, I mean, just these basic shapes in here, this is all the same battles that the Ember was fighting back in the day. Um, it's still in this form here, the passive pyrolysis, the passive drawing. Okay. It's still working off the same four processes. So we're getting a combustion load to start here. Um, the load the combustion propagates forward until we run out of oxygen. <coughs> Reduction in here, um, the reduced gas from the CO and hydrogen goes off. The passive pyrolysis up here is a massive problem. So those, so those are the four processes of gasification. Um, those are what, when you look at a, a textbook explanation of how gasification works, well, those four processes called out and then shown how they combine and recombine in different gas Okay? Questions? Well, that would be, we wouldn't have that on uh, right here, right? It's in there somewhere. Sorry, I have 16. We're on the second circle. We two days ago. Two more rings. I'm changing all around. So, okay, so any questions okay. on gasification as understood in the second ring? I have one. Your, your volatile gas, are they composed of the same thing as the wood? Wait, what? The, the volatile, you said when gasification happens, uh, the volatile goes out first, and they become tar and uh, yeah. What are they composed of chemically? Hydrogen and CO and... They're, they're carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen atoms, and they're combined in a whole variety of, of different uh, hydrocarbon types. I mean, there's a typical gas, gas fire you can identify of over 400 different of, um, unique species of, of chemicals. So, um, collectively, we call them TARs. Uh, they go over a huge gap. So, I can call it charts. But there's still hydrogen and CO coming out. They're all, well, they're all hydrogen, carbon, and oxygen atoms. The original biomass is made up of hydrogen, carbon, and oxygen atoms. That's all it is, other than some trace elements. Okay? So, those, get, those atoms get combined into different molecular forms. 